Okay, good afternoon. Today we are going to talk about some new high-efficiency piezoelectric energy harvesters that were developed at NASA Langley Research Center. My name is Mia Siochi. I'm from the Advanced Materials and Processing branch here. Um, other speaker, the other speaker is going to be Jisoo, also from the Advanced Materials and Processing branch. Our collaborators are Tian Bing Su and Jin Ho Kang, both from the National Institute of Aerospace, or NIA. NASA Langley has had a history of transferring some actuator technologies developed here to industry. On this chart are examples of a couple of commercially available actuators that are based on NASA inventions. On the left is Thunder, which stands for Thin Layer Composite Unimorph Ferroelectric Driver and Sensor. These devices are currently available from FACE International, and there's more information on these devices at the link that's shown here for FACE International Corporation. Another commercially available actuator is the piezoelectric microfiber composite technology shown on the right, which is available from Smart Materials Corporation. Their website information is shown here. More recently, there's another example of actuation technology developed here. It's called the Hybrid Actuation System, or HIBAS for short. Shown here is a schematic of this actuator, which combines two electroactive constituents. EAP stands for electrostrictive G elastomer, which is shown here in orange. And ESC designates the electroactive single crystal element, which is shown here in gray. EAP offers positive dimensional change, while ESC responds with negative dimensional change under an electric field in a lateral direction. So what HiBus is doing is using the characteristics of the electromechanical response of the two electroactive constituents cooperatively in order to achieve significantly increased displacement for actuation with one single um, input stimulus. So the performance of HiBus is summarized on the right. It is shown here as a function of applied voltage where the displacement is plotted on the y-axis against position on the x-axis. So you can note that the displacement of the hybrid system is greater than either one of the elements alone, with a contribution from the EAP element being greater at the higher applied field shown in the bottom of the series of plots. Both of these technologies take advantage of piezoelectric materials. These are materials that either change their geometry or dimensions in response to the applied voltage, or they generate electric charges when mechanical force is applied. So the ability of piezoelectric materials to generate voltage in response to mechanical stimulus is what we want to take advantage of in the devices that will be described today. These characteristics of the piezoelectric materials lend them to being used as actuators, as I've already shown, or as energy harvesters. So we are going to be talking about several piezoelectric energy harvester designs. Jisoo will be talking about uh, one version, and then I will come in later with a uh, different type of energy harvester. So the first type of piezoelectric energy harvester will be discussed by Jisoo. It's called a hybrid piezoelectric energy harvesting transistor system, or HIPET. Thank you very much. So a hybrid actuation system was developed at the NASA Longley Research Center. Uh, years ago, the device demonstrated significant enhancement in actuation performance and proved a concept. Two electromechanically electromechan active constituents offering opposite electromechanical response to an uh, electrical excitement can be utilized in a cooperative mechanism for enhanced actuation performance. So as, as everybody knows, the electromechanical function basically is conversible, right? It's kind of, you can use the system to convert electrical energy to mechanical energy, or you use mechanical energy converted to the electrical energy. And then we are doing some re revision to the actuation system, trying to make the system for the energy harvesting. That's why we have this. HIPET, which is Hybrid Pedoelectric Energy Harvesting Transducer System. We have multi-layer stack and uh, multi-layer constituent for the inner part, and for the outer part, we are using the multiple stacks. So for the 
In our part, we use D3-1 effect. For the outer curved part, we are using the D3-3 effect. And uh, we choose the materials from the APC International uh, 855. It's a PZT-based ceramics. And because they have reported as high uh, conversion efficiency and high pedal electrical constants, so the detailed information of the materials is given at the corner of the right slide. So this slide give us uh, some kind of configuration and uh, force distribution analysis. As you can see, we have inner layer and uh, outer layer. And then when we have the force applied on the top of the outer layer, the force will be distributed symmetrically to two ends. And then the whole device will experience either compression or the stretching. This is a formula we are using for the force analysis, for the modeling and uh, uh, calculations. And uh, in this slide, we are giving some uh, basic information about the theoretical modeling we are used for this energy harvesting transducer system. And we just calculated contribution from each constituent and how much contribution from each constituent. And then we can see the improvement ratio of the hybrid comparing with the same size of lactational transducer. If you see the formula, you can see it's always one plus some factors. This factor is always uh, larger than zero, okay? And then that means we always have the enhancement. As, as long as we have the right uh, parallel electrical constant and uh, the geometry of the whole device. This slide showing the result of the characterization of the iPad. As you can see from the Right, uh, left side, that's a setup for the characterization. We have a shaker on the bottom and the test the fixture of moving part of the shaker and the accelerometer and roof mass on the top of the device iPad. We did the frequency dependence analysis and the roof mass effect on the performance. As you can see from the figure on the right, the power generation can be maximized at the resonance frequency. You can see all these peaks. And the power generation in the range of the off resonance frequency is also significant. In addition to the power generation at the peak, off peak part, we can still see the significant power generation. And when you increase the proof mass, the generated electrical power is increased. And then resonance frequency is decreased. As you can see, it shifts from higher frequency to a lower frequency. And then the, the amplitude of the peak increased when the proof mass is increased. And what, we take this curve as an example to see what performance we can achieve for this hybrid device at the resonance frequency. And we can get about, about 250 millivolts electrical power, and uh, we have the power density is about 12 millivolts per gram at the resonance frequency, which is 515 hertz with 200 gram proof mass. So in addition to the frequency dependence characterization of the device, and we also test the charging capability of the device to a capacitor. As you can see, we need about eight seconds to charge the supercapacitor from zero to seven volts. And the storage energy is about 160 millijoule. This is at the resonance frequency, which is a 515 hertz. And we also do the test and characterization of the device for the performance of resonance frequency. We are using the same setup with a framed uh, system. And from the figures on the right, you can see how much contribution to the generated voltage from outer layer, from inner layer, inner layer, and also the overall electrical power generated. As you can see, 
both constitutes give more voltage generation when you have applied force increased. And for the electrical power generated, as the high bus, the whole system, the power generation increases as the force applied increases. And then also you can see the electrical power generated increases as the frequency increase. But all this frequency is in the range of the off resonance frequency. And then we can do some calculation. We find generated voltage is proportional to the applied force. Generated electrical power proportional to the frequency and the square of the applied force. 185 millivolts electrical power can be generated at 530 hertz and 40 newton. So this is uh, the weight of the devices. It's 21 grams. That's the weight we are using for the uh, calculation for the power generated per weight. And then if we see the contribution from each constitute to the electrical power generated, you can also see the similar phenomena for the outer one and for the inner one. Both of them show the increase as a function of the applied force and as a function of the frequency. And if you see the bottom part of this chart, you can see this output power ratio of the outer layer and the inner layer. Basically, no matter at what frequency and at what type of uh, the force applied, and then the ratio of the contribution from each constituent, basically constant. constant. And then we did some uh, calculation to see what the efficiency of conversion from mechanical energy to electrical energy. And we find the energy conversion efficiency is about 40%. And that is independent of force applied on that and the frequency. We compare these experimental uh, results with that uh, modeling results. We can see they agree with each other quite well. And 40% of the mechanical energy converted to the electrical energy, it's a pretty significant number. And for the charging performance of the device of the resonance frequency, we can see some uh, difference uh, if you compare to the charging capability at resonance frequency. That really depends on the condition of the test. If we test that at 100 hertz frequency with 40 newton force applied, we need about 23 seconds to charge the supercapacitor from zero to seven volts, which means it's much longer time than the charging capability at the resonance frequency. And we can generate store about uh, 160 millijoule electrical energy. However, if we adjust the test condition, we can see the charging performance or charging capability can be very comparable with the uh, charging capability at resonance frequency. So we just, uh, if we use 40 Newton force at 400 hertz, which is off the resonance frequency, we can charge the supercapacitor from zero to seven volts within about eight seconds. And we stored about 160 millijoule electrical energy. That means the hybrid energy harvester can perform no matter if it's a resonance frequency or off resonance frequency to give us the desired result. And as the concluding remarks for this part, we can see the proven hybrid concept is really good for the advanced electromechanical devices, including this energy harvesting device. And this hybrid energy harvesting device shows significant performance for both at resonance frequency and off resonance frequency. And uh, the conversion of the energy from mechanical energy to electrical energy can be about 40%. It's very high efficiency. And then if you compare this uh, 
hybrid energy harvester with existing Simba harvester or other flux tensional energy harvester, we can get about five times higher power output. And uh, since this device can work in both resonance frequency and uh, off resonance frequency, it's, it is a broadband energy harvester. And then the chart on the top of the right showing that what's existing technology and what the performance of this hybrid energy harvester can, can get. And then we hope this can be a technology people can recognize and then use in the reality. Thank you very much. I'm going to transition now to the um, energy harvester that I'm going to talk about. This is the multi-layer stack flex tensional harvesters. There are commercially available energy harvesters that are based on using PZT as a material. PZT stands for lead zirconium titanate. And they're at the heart of these energy harvesters in the form of multi-layer stacks of 3-3 mode PZT. This type of PZT is, has been shown to yield the best performing energy harvesters because in this 3-3 mode, dipole moment is parallel to mechanical force input. So this mode of PZT is able to attain three to five times higher mechanical to electrical energy conversion efficiency compared to the material in the 3-1 mode where the dipole moment is perpen perpendicular to the mechanical force input. So further, by using PZT in a multi-layer stack, more electrical charges are generated compared to a single layer of PZT. And when you take the stack and house it within a flex tensional frame, input forces captured from ambient vibrations are amplified so that greater mechanical energy goes into the 3-3 mode PZT stacks. So using these design considerations, these harvesters generate electrical power um, in commercially available devices. But in the case of those types of devices, what we have found is that they generate less than 100 milliwatts of power and that the resonance frequency that they operate under is generally higher than those that are useful for many practical applications. So what we're going to talk about today is, a, um, is an energy harvester design that expands on the forest amplification principle. So we show here on the chart uh, a design using a two-stage amplifier. The first stage consists of a large outer flex tensional frame that is used to amplify force input, and the second stage is inside this larger frame. It's composed of four serially connected flex tensional frames that further amplify the input force before those forces are applied to each of the piezoelectric stack that's inside these frames. So the input force on the multilayer stack is effectively quantified as amplifications for the first stage multiplied by the amplification of the second stage, which is designated here in the equation as M1 and M2. The mechanical energy transferred into the PZT stack is proportional to the square of the force, which is applied on each stack. So by enhancing the input forces in this way, it is possible to capture a lot more mechanical energy for inputs to the 3-3 mode PZT stacks. So we're use, looking at using these piezoelectric energy harvesters in broader applications by designing them to respond to ambient vibrations that are commonly available. The chart shown here lists examples of environments where these may be used. They include things like car engines and clothes dryers and HVAC vents and office buildings, among other things. What we observe from this list is that these environments produce vibrations in frequencies ranging from tens to hundreds of hertz rather than in the kilohertz range. In order to benchmark the performance of the energy harvester we developed, we looked at how much power it needs to generate for it to have practical and relevant applications. So the chart here shows that a power consumption of some devices that can take advantage of renewable energy sources are small devices that benefit from uh, power sources on the order of hundreds of milliwatts. So in the following charts, we're going to demonstrate the performance of the piezoelectric electric devices that we developed here. One, uh, one configuration for the energy harvester that we designed is shown here to be operated by just using a force from finger compression as a force input to the stack. 
So the overall dimension of this energy harvester is about 70 millimeters by 38 millimeters by 31 millimeters, and the weight is about 88 grams. But at the heart of this device are ceramic stacks, and each stack is about 7 millimeters by 7 millimeters by 32 millimeters, and these weigh about 9 grams. So what we're showing here is that we're cyclically compressing the ceramic stacks, and the voltage generated, as shown on the plot on the left, is on the order of plus or minus 10 volts at 4.5 hertz. And this translates into approximately 3.5 milliwatts of electrical power generated. Over a few minutes, we can charge up a 6600 microfarad supercapacitor, shown on the right. So we can charge this from 0 to 6 volts over about 6 minutes. And the, the stored energy is over 100 millijoules. So on this chart, we show the same or similar uh, piezoelectric energy harvester that's now mounted on a um, load frame. And we use this configuration so that we can control the input forces in a broad range of frequencies. So using this setup, the input forces that we tried are 1 newton, 5 newtons, 10 newtons, and 50 newtons. Um, these forces were applied at various frequencies. And the plots on the right show the results. So the applied force is shown on the top plot, and then the voltage generated is in the middle plot, and the power that's generated as a result of these voltages is shown in the bottom. So the middle plot shows that the voltage generated increased proportionally with the input force. And then on the bottom plot, what we, sh what we see is that the electrical power is proportional to the frequency and the square of the applied force. On this chart, we, um, we generated the data shown on this chart by mounting the piezo harvester on the surface of a shaker to simulate its response to vibration inputs. So the resonance frequency for this device is in the range of about 108 hertz. Um, and when operated in resonance mode without a proof mass, the plot on the left shows that the voltage generated is about 10 volts for half a G of acceleration. And this rate of acceleration is akin to what you get in a blender. The power generated is approximately 350 milliwatts. And when we use the harvester in this configuration, the middle plot shows that it took about eight seconds to fully charge a 6600 microfarad capacitor from zero to about seven volts. If the acceleration were now increased to one G, which is the level of vibration from a car engine, the rightmost plot shows that it only took took two seconds to fully charge the capacitor. So now, um, another mode of operating these harvesters is adding a proof mass and using them at resonance frequencies. What we see here is that depending on the proof mass that we use, we use uh, on the left plot, we show no proof mass for the black curve, uh, 20 grams of proof mass for the red curve, and then 40 and 50 grams for the blue curves. What we see is that as the proof mass is increased, the resonance frequency gets lower. So what we can do here is that the proof mass can be used to tune the resonance frequency of the harvester. You can note that when we add 50 grams of proof mass at a quarter of a G acceleration, this acceleration is similar to the level that you get from a clothes dryer, and it took only eight seconds to fully charge the um, supercapacitor. So, that's just to show the performance of the harvester that we developed. But we wanted to compare the performance of the NASA-developed harvester with one that's commercially available. We recognize, however, that what we have here is a two-stage harvester, and commercially available harvesters are generally single-stage. And so, you know, how do we how do we really fairly evaluate the performance of our harvester compared to one that we're using to benchmark it. Knowing that ours is a two-stage harvester and the commercially available, harvesters are also made with PC, PCT stacks, but they only use one stage for amplification. So what we're showing here is the performance of a one-stage and a two-stage harvester that we made. So that the one-stage harvester has the frame dimensions and geometry that, that's, that are the same as what we use to include in the two-stage harvester. 
The plot on the right shows that at off resonance frequency of uh, 50 hertz, let's pick 50 hertz as the point of comparison, the power output for the two-stage amplifier is about 13 times greater per stack. If we just normalize the output based on the number of PZT elements that are responding to the input mechanical energy. So in a two-stage, there are four stacks. In a one-stage, there's only one stack. So that output that we're, we're, we're saying is 13 times greater is is already divided by the number of stacks. Otherwise, the total difference would be about 52 times greater. So when we operate these devices at the resonance frequency, which is 108 hertz for the two-stage harvester and one kilohertz for the one-stage system, the power output is about 13 times per stack better for the two-stage harvester. Um, but the difference is that the two-stage harvester op operates at a broader range of practical frequencies since it's in the hundreds of hertz rather than in the kilohertz. So, as I said, uh, we're trying to make a valid comparison of the NASA developed harvester with a commercial energy harvester, knowing that the commercial harvester uses a one-stage device. And the dimensions of, those, of that one-stage device are not exactly the same as um, what we use in our two-stage devices. So as much as possible, what we want to do is make the comparison um, by being conservative and dividing the response that we get from the NASA harvester by four as a way of normalizing the output. So we're basically just normalizing based on what we know to be the number of piezoelectric elements that are in the harvester. So in this chart, what we're looking at is the comparison of the Langley harvester um, versus a commercial harvester operating at off-resonance power at the same level of acceleration. Without proof mass at the off-resonance frequency, such as 50 hertz on the left plot, the two-stage harvester generates about 600 times more electrical power per stack than the commercial harvester working at the same level of acceleration and frequency. And when a proof mass of 50 grams is added to both harvesters, and this is the ideal operating condition for both harvesters, the two-stage harvester still puts out about 50 times per stack more power than the commercial harvester. So also note that on the left plot, even without a proof mass, the two-stage NASA harvester displays a stronger uh, resonance peak than the commercial harvester, which is being operated here without a proof mass. So to summarize the difference in performance, without proof mass, the generated electrical power from the Langley harvester is about 600 times per stack higher than the commercial harvester operating at the same off-resonance frequency. And if, if we're comparing them uh, with the proof mass, the generated electrical power from the Langley harvester is about 50 times per stack higher than the commercial harvester working at the same off-resonance frequency. And finally, the Langley harvester has a strong uh, resonance peak even without the proof mass. Okay, here we're comparing the performance of the harvesters with match resistors because this is the configuration that yields the highest power output. And what we see is that under the same measurement condition, the two-stage harvester delivers 10 times per stack more power than the single-stage commercial harvester. The total power output for the Langley harvester shown here is 64 milliwatts, and so when we normalize it by four, this comes out to about 16 milliwatts per stack. In comparison, the one-stage commercial device puts out about 1.7 milliwatts of power. So this is about 10 times slower uh, power output from the commercial harvester in comparison to the NASA harvester. So when we compare the performance of the devices at their resonance frequencies, the power output of the Langley device operated without a proof mass, shown here on the left, is about three times better than the commercial harvester. Um, the total output and power is about 68 milliwatts, so when we normalize it, it's about 17 milliwatts per stack at the resonance frequency of about 100 hertz. On the right uh, is data shown for the commercial harvester that's operating at its resonance frequency of about 1 kilohertz with a 53 gram proof mass. The total power output of, in this configuration was about 5.5 milliwatts. So if we normalize the output of the Langley device per stack, it's still about three times greater than the commercial device operating under its optimal conditions. 
So in this chart, what we're showing is that with about the same proof mass of 50 grams at 0.25 g of acceleration, the two-stage NASA harvester required less than 10 seconds to fully charge a supercapacitor. Um, operating at its resonance frequency, a higher acceleration of 1.5 g was required for the commercial harvester to fully charge a supercapacitor as shown in the rightmost plot. And it required about 40 seconds to do so. so if we normalize charging time again by four, it took about six times greater acceleration to fully charge a supercapacitor for the commercial device versus the NASA device. So in conclusion, what we have shown here is that um, when we compare the performance of the two-stage harvester developed at NASA, um, it generates significantly higher electrical power than a commercially available harvester under various combinations of conditions. And we showed the performance at resonance and off resonance with and without approved mass and using matched resistive loads. At resonance mode, the NASA harvester, either with or without proof mass, actually charged the capacitor faster than a commercial harvester operating with proof mass. And finally, the resonance frequency of the um, NASA harvester is in the range of many practical applications compared to the commercial harvester. So now we want to demonstrate the actual performance of these harvesters in a couple of examples shown in the video. So now we're going to demonstrate the performance of this energy harvester with two examples. The first one we'll show is of a wireless sensor, and the second demonstration will illustrate how enough power can be generated to light up some LEDs. Uh, the setup here shows a black box, which is an XYZ sensor, so it gives you XYZ location. Um, it's mounted on top of a mock aircraft, and it's going to be powered by the piezoelectric energy harvester, which is shown here as being attached to a shaker, which is going to simulate vibrations that will be used as input forces. The voltage generated is going to be tracked by um, this voltmeter and then stored in the supercapacitors shown. Okay, so we're plugging in the, the shaker so that you can see that the uh, voltage is generated immediately in response to the input force. And when we get up to about 4 volts, this should be enough to initiate the operation of the wireless sensor. So when we get there, we're going to hook up the wireless sensor. And you can see that the uh, mock aircraft is being moved up and down, sideways, and that the signal of those locations are being recorded remotely. Uh, the computer and the receiver for those signals are located about 300 feet away in another room. And the blue, the green, and the red signals indicate the location of the mock aircraft in the X, the Y, and the Z direction. So the second demonstration we're going to show is using uh, the piezoelectric energy harvester to light up about 50 LEDs. There are two colors. Uh, it spells out NASA, and as we're compressing, the energy harvester is generating enough voltage that's directly being used to light up the LEDs. And so we are using two stacks in this case because what we're doing here is generating AC voltage and every other LED is connected in the opposite phase to make sure that half of the LEDs light up when the generated voltage is positive and the other half lights up when the generated voltage is negative. And based on the voltage requirements for these LEDs that we used here, we estimated about 700 milliwatts of power were generated in each compression cycle in order to actually light up the LEDs.